Thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for the chance to talk to you today. So I'm always excited to give this talk because I get to, uh, you know, go on and on for about 45 minutes about my very favorite subject in all of astrophysics, and that is interstellar dust. So to get started, out there in between the stars in our galaxy is this very dilute material um, that's made of gas and dust, um, and we call this the interstellar medium. So um, when I say dilute here, what I mean it's very low density. So on average, there's about one atom of hydrogen per cubic centimeter of the interstellar medium. So there are places where it gets much, much denser than that, and there are places where it's even less dense than that. But on, on average, one particle per cubic centimeter. For reference, you know, in the room, I think we have something like 10 to the 19 particles per cubic centimeter. Um, so this is, a, this is better than any vacuum we can create on Earth, and yet it's still a huge amount of material out there in space. So the interstellar medium is actually, in my opinion, the most interesting part of a galaxy. Um, I kind of think of it like the guts of a galaxy. It's where um, all of the interesting new star formation is happening. It's where, um, when they die, old stars deposit this material that they've enriched with heavier elements. So all, uh, all of the heavy elements in general are produced by some process that occurs in stars, either in their normal lifetime or when they explode later at the end of their life. And that material that they produce goes back into the interstellar medium, and there's this big process of recycling that's happening. Um, and over time, the interstellar medium gets more and more enriched with these heavy elements. So a lot of those heavy elements actually are in the form of grains of dust. And that is what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, so to get started on that topic, uh, the first question I want to ask is, how do we even know that there's dust out there? The answer to that question is probably somewhat clear just from looking at this beautiful image, which shows us the Milky Way in visible light. Um, so just by looking at this, you can already kind of see there's these patchy regions here that look darker than the rest of the galaxy. And the reason, the basic reason we know that dust is out there is because dust grains block light, visible light, from, from getting to us. So if we look in a direction through the disk of the Milky Way and we see there, and there's a cloud of gas and dust in the way between us and some stars we want to observe, those stars actually appear fainter and sometimes we can't even see them because of the presence of this dusty cloud in the way. So um, this, the presence of dust was really noticed even fairly early on in the history of our knowledge of the Milky Way. Um, this, for instance, is a map that was made by William and Caroline Herschel, some astronomers in the 1700s, who tried to, they, they assumed basically that you could see the most distant star that was in the Milky Way. So if you looked in all these different directions and found out, figured out what kind of the faintest star you could see in that direction was, they thought you were seeing sort of to the edge of the, of the galaxy. Um, however, when you do that and you try to make a map of what this looks like, you get this. And uh, this looks nothing like a galaxy. Um, so the reason this looks so funny and has these big kind of divots and like little patches in there is because there's dust in the way. And we can't actually see to the, the other side of the galaxy in some directions in visible light because there's these clouds of dust in our, in our, in, in, along those lines of sight. So people were generally aware that there's something out there blocking the light from stars, um, but it wasn't clear until much later uh, what that actually was. And I want to tell you about the um, experiment and the test that really gave the clearest insight into the fact that these are tiny grains of dust out there in the interstellar gas. And that experiment was done by uh, uh, an astronomer named Robert Trumpler. In 1930, he uh, published a paper that demonstrated uh, an important fact. So he saw, he saw two things. So he was looking at clusters of stars. Here's a cluster of stars. Um, and he noticed that the star clusters that were very distant appeared to be fainter than they would be predicted to be. And he also observed that these distant star clusters, when they were fainter, they were also redder. 
So here's my little diagram. Uh, we're looking at two star clusters. One is further away than the other one. And the further away star cluster looks fainter than you think it should, and it looks redder. The redder is, is an important part for understanding dust. So here's a plot from uh, Trumpler's paper that shows the observation he made. So he assumed that the star clusters all have about the same size and the same intrinsic brightness. And so when you put them further and further away, um, they, first of all, just from the distance, look smaller and they look fainter. And so um, on this axis of the plot, this is the distance you expect for that cluster based on how big it looks on the sky. And on this axis of the plot is the distance you expect for the cluster based upon how bright it appears. So if you think you know how bright it is intrinsically and you can observe how bright it is as it appears, then you get um, this distance measurement. And so here's a one-to-one -one line, and this is what he observed. So this difference shows us that as you get clusters further and further away, they appear even fainter than you think they should. And they also appear redder. So that was a key observation. And put that, putting that information together, what Trempler said is the following. Um, interstellar light absorption may be a consequence of light scattering by small particles of fine cosmic dust thinly spread through the vast spaces occupied by our Milky Way system. And I always like this quote because no astronomy paper today is quite this poetic. I don't know, I always, I think it sounds the fine cosmic dust in the vast spaces. Anyway, so um, this was an important insight. And we're going to talk, I'm going to tell you in a, in a little bit about why the reddening of the, the colors of these star clusters is really the key piece of information that tells us these are tiny particles of dust. But before we get into that, um, what I want to spend a few minutes talking about is why should you even care? So, I mean, you've all come to a talk now to hear about interstellar dust. Um, why, why is interstellar dust even important? You know, it's out there, but not necessary that you should care about it. So here's, I have four reasons. Um, and hopefully by the end of this little chunk, you'll be convinced that you care about interstellar dust. So the first reason is that Interstellar dust actually plays a critical role in how galaxies work. So um, a galaxy is an assembly of stars. So over time, you have to form those stars. Stars form in very dense patches of the interstellar medium. And they get dense enough that they can actually collapse under the effect of their own gravity. But to collapse, you actually um, you know, you have to not have enough thermal pressure support um, to prevent that collapse. So you need to get places in the interstellar medium very cold and very dense because then it can just start collapsing and there's, no, there's not as much pressure to kind of uh, fight back against gravity. So the places where you can get cold temperatures, you can get the gas really cold, are the spots that are kind of shielded from all of the starlight, other, all of the existing starlight in the galaxy by dust grains. So dust grains block that light, they absorb and they, they reflect um, photons, and it protects these little stellar nurseries where the gas is getting denser and denser and denser from heating up. So they keep things nice and cold there. Um, it also turns out that those regions where you get gas very dense, you want to have the gas in the form of molecules and not just uh, atoms. You want uh, molecules are better at cooling off, actually. So you want to get your gas into molecular form. And one of the most abundant molecule in the interstellar medium, as you might guess, because it's the most abundant atom in the universe, is hydrogen. So molecular hydrogen. And in order to form a molecule of hydrogen, um, if you just had two hydrogens come along and try to you know, form a molecule, it actually is not a very effective reaction. It's much easier if you have the two hydrogens meet up on a surface of a dust grain because they, can, they require to, to give away some energy in that process and the dust grain is happy to take care of that. So this formation of molecular hydrogen happens on the surface of dust grains. So basically, the point here is that when you want to have a galaxy form stars, um, the way it works, for the most part, except for the very first galaxies in our universe, which is a whole different talk, and maybe someone's already told you about that, um, but you need to have dust. 
to cool things off to provide this surface for hydrogens to find each other and become molecular hydrogen. Okay, so that's reason number one. Reason number two is a very practical reason. And that is that anytime we want to look at any astronaut object that is outside of our solar system, essentially, even some that are inside of our solar system now and then you have to worry about this, but uh, outside of our solar system, you're going to have to look through some dust. So if you're looking at wavelengths where dust blocks or um, you know, absorbs or scatters photons, then um, the observation you want to make is going to be heavily influenced by the dust that is in your way. Um, this is a map showing actually the whole Milky Way. So the disk of the Milky Way is along the center of this map and the looking straight out of the top and the bottom of the Milky Way are the, the poles of this map. And it's 360 degrees, so it's unwrapped the whole sky. And what you see here is uh, regions where there's a lot of dust and regions where there's little dust. But there is dust everywhere in this image. Some, re some spots have less, but there's always dust. So anytime you want to look at another astronomical object, if you're looking at a wavelength where dust plays a role, then you have to take this into account. Um, and sometimes, you know, this is a surprise, and sometimes there are wavelengths where you don't think dust is playing a huge role, where it really is. And one of those is for people who try to study the cosmic microwave background radiation, for instance, which is the remnant um, in uh, the radiation from the Big Bang. And what's very important for some of those types of observations is the polarization of light. Now it turns out not only does dust block light, um, when it emits light, it emits polarized light sometimes. And this is a map that was made um, by the Planck satellite. And it, you see in color basically the same thing you were seeing before, so where there is dust. But all these swirly lines are the magnetic field that is also going throughout the interstellar medium. And the emission from dust is polarized along this magnetic field direction. So this has to be taken into account too, even when you want to study something like the cosmic microwave background radiation. So that's the very practical reason. One other reason that you might care about dust is that dust actually lets us study galaxies throughout the history of the universe. So um, one of the things we're going to talk about is when dust absorbs a photon, when a dust grain absorbs a photon, it gets a little bit warm, like it heats up a tiny bit. So the dust then has a temperature in our galaxy of around 18 degrees Kelvin on average. In other galaxies, it can be warmer. In some galaxies, it can be like 50 Kelvin, maybe even warmer than that. Um, and everything that has a temperature emits some light. So for something that has a temperature of about 18 Kelvin, it emits most of its light in the infrared. So if we had the ability to look around the Milky Way in the infrared, and we do with telescopes, which I'll show you shortly, um, you would see dust glowing everywhere instead of blocking the light. In the infrared, it glows. And it turns out that we can actually see the dust in very distant galaxies glowing across all of the universe. So this image you've now been looking at for a little while and you may have been like, that's weird, why is she showing me like static or something like this? This is just noise. But actually this is not noise at all. This is a patch of the sky that was observed with the Herschel Space Observatory and it's a patch, it's one of those spots on the sky that's really got nothing, no, nothing much going on. So when you look in that direction and you look deeply enough, you actually see galaxies through all distant, you know, throughout many distances in the universe. And this image, every single dot you see here um, is actually a galaxy. Um, anywhere, you know, all the way to extremely distant galaxies. And this is the infrared light from their dust. So by observing this light from these galaxies, we can learn a huge amount about how they're uh, forming stars and what their history is and where they are and all kinds of things. So um, dust is, is useful as a tool to understand the history of how galaxies evolved. So actually there's so many galaxies you can see in the infrared with telescopes like Herschel that, that people call this confusion noise. 
So it's, if, you, if you put down another galaxy on top of here, the main source of uncertainty in your measurement of how bright that galaxy is is the fact that it's confused with hundreds of background galaxies. So this is, this is real. <laughs> So there's one more reason I think you should be excited about dust and pay attention, and that is a very self-centered reason. And that is that the material that makes up our bodies and Earth and you know, most of the things we need for everyday life um, were once in dust grains. So a large fraction of the heavy elements like carbon and silicon and magnesium and iron were in dust grains before they were in planets and Earth. So this is the starting point, it's the initial condition for forming planets and humans. Okay, so before um, getting into a bit more detail about interstellar dust, uh, I want to make a few points about how we observe dust and what the basics of the techniques we use are to, to observe dust. So I think um, to start, the key point to make, of course, in this case, and for most of astronomy, is that all you have really is light. I'm going to tell you one exception to that rule. So, but for the most part, all we can do is observe light coming from these objects and try to interpret what it's telling us. So as a review, here we've got the electromagnetic spectrum. The, the part we can see with our eyes is this tiny little sliver right here. And the most important part for studying dust in a lot of cases is going to be the infrared part. So we talked already a bit about infrared light. So I just want to clarify, infrared, of course, is light that is too long of wavelength for us to see with our, our eyes. And I'm going to be showing you a lot of images that are made with infrared cameras and telescopes. So this is uh, something to keep in mind when you see these beautiful pictures. So there's two main techniques that we use to, or to study light that's coming from these astronomical sources. One of them is spectroscopy, which you will be familiar with for uh, a visible light, potentially by the, you know, being able to break apart the sun's spectrum into a, its components using a prism. So here is a plot that shows two spectra of different kinds of stars. Um, so we've got wavelength on one axis, and this is the brightness or the intensity of the light that's coming to us um, on the y-axis here. And you can see these two stars have very different spectra. So this is a, a, a hotter, massive star, and this is a cooler, low-mass star. So we learn a whole bunch about um, astronomical objects by breaking apart the light into these constituent wavelengths and analyzing them separately. Um, the other thing we can do is a lot is basically it's called photometry, and this is using some kind of filter, um, like you would do with a camera, for instance, uh, to basically total up the amount of light in some range of wavelengths and give you a measurement of the whole, the average or the total amount of light in that band. And so we can do that for these two different stars, and you can see that one of them would have much more light in this particular range of wavelengths um, based on this photometric measurement. So a lot of the images I'm going to show you are photometric measurements. So they are in a band pass like that, or a filter like that, um, and they are in the infrared. So these are wavelengths we would never be able to see with our eyes normally. But when we capture them with a camera, we can put them together and assign them different colors from the visible part of the spectrum we can see, like blue, green, and red, and then combine those to have a false color image that shows you um, some property of the, the dust that you're seeing. So this is a, an image that involves wavelengths of 3.6, 4.5, and 8 microns. And we have assigned those blue, green, and red, and then combined it so it looks like a three-color image we might see. But none of these wavelengths would actually be something we could see with our eye. With that, let's talk about how we study interstellar dust. Um, and I just told you that for astronomical objects, for the most part, um, what we have is light. And in general, that is very much true for interstellar dust. But there is one exception, and I think this is kind of fun, so I like to mention it. Um, Several years ago, there was a space probe that was sent up to orbit around the solar system um, and collect particles of dust. So this was called Stardust. Um, and it, this thing up here, this, uh, this is a, something, they called it an aerogel. So it's a big um, thing that each of these little uh, 
regions here are full of this hard gel substance. So when a dust grain came along and ran into it, it would get stuck. And it would just sweep around the solar system, catching all of the dust. And it orbited around a couple of times, and then it came back to Earth and brought this back. So for the most part, um, the dust it was catching up there is dust from our solar system, right? It's like asteroids that, you know, when they run into each other, they grind up in little particles of dust. So there's, there's tons of dust that's in our solar system. So we wouldn't consider that interstellar dust because it's been through the process of, like, you know, forming asteroids and planets and stuff like that. But we do know that there is a certain direction that the particles from interstellar space are moving because the sun and all of the planets are moving through the galaxy in a certain direction. So there's dust coming in this way from the interstellar space. And what you can tell from the direction that the grains impacted this aerogel, which kind of dust particle it was, whether it was from the, the solar system or whether it was from interstellar space. And they were lucky enough to find, I believe, seven interstellar dust grains in uh, the aerogel when they brought it back. And this is very exciting. So I think um, analysis of these dust grains is ongoing. They have to be extremely careful because they're you know, seven and they're really small. And so you don't want to like mess them up. But um, we're hopefully going to learn some interesting things about the composition of interstellar dust from this. What we are left with is trying to understand dust based on light. So that could be light from stars that the dust uh, interacts with, or it could be light that the dust produces. So let me just say a few words about how dust interacts with light. Um, first off, it can absorb it. So that means it takes a photon, usually an ultraviolet or an optical photon, and just it is absorbed in the grain and turned into internal heat in that grain. Um, Dust can also scatter photons, so that means just reflect it off in a different direction. And the best um, visual ex example of that, I think, is the Pleiades. So hopefully a lot of you have seen the Pleiades with your naked eye. Um, if you look in more detail, it's this fuzzy blue patch, right? And the reason it looks fuzzy is because behind these bright stars of the Pleiades, there is this cloud of dust that reflects light from those stars back at us. So we see this fuzzy um, patch around it that is reflected starlight off of dust. And that's why it's called a reflection nebula. Then lastly, let's talk about emission. So once these grains heat up a little bit, Everything that has some temperature emits light um, with a thermal spectrum. So dust is um, about 20 to several hundred degrees Kelvin in the interstellar medium. And at those temperatures, it emits in infrared wavelengths, as we've discussed. And so when, if we want to study dust, you know, we have these options. So we can look at starlight that has been kind of interfered by you know, something. It's done, dust has done something to it on its way to us. Or we can go directly to the source and look at the infrared emission that dust produces. And so here is the Orion Nebula, very beautiful. Hopefully everyone's seen this at some point. Um, you can see there's these dark features up here, and there's a lot of stuff that's kind of dark around here. Of course, this part is really bright, because this is a, a region where gas is ionized and is producing um, all this beautiful emission. Uh, but if we look at this nebula in the infrared part of the spectrum, it looks quite different. So what you see now um, in red is infrared emission at, uh, uh, captured by the Spitzer Space Telescope. And you can see that all of those spots that looked faint in that previous image now glow quite brightly in the infrared. Um, and I like that it, you see this whole structure actually like s sweeping down here that's really not obvious from the, uh, the optical image that we look at. And that is because there's dust everywhere here and it's glowing because it's been heated up by, by the star formation that's happening in Orion. So this is great. We can learn a lot about dust from this infrared emission. Um, the problem is that our atmosphere is really annoying when it comes to infrared emission. So most infrared light does not make it to the ground. It's absorbed in our atmosphere. Um, and so basically, you know, we can see visible light on the ground. We can see radio waves on the ground. But for the infrared, we have to do something different. And that is um, send telescopes to space. 
So this is very exciting. Um, so here's a little compilation of some of the major infrared observatories that have been put in space over the last several decades. Um, kind of the first major one was the IRAS satellite in 1983, which had a 57-centimeter mirror. I've already shown you several images from Spitzer, which was, uh, is, is still up there, but has run out of coolant, so it only operates at um, short wavelengths at the moment. Um, but this telescope was sent up in 2003 with an 85-centimeter mirror. And then in 2009, um, Herschel, the Herschel Space Observatory, was launched. Uh, and that has a three and a half meter mirror. So over time, we've been getting these bigger and bigger infrared telescopes in space to try to study interstellar dust. So now that we've talked about how you study dust, um, I want to get to answer your question and tell you a bit about the basics of what interstellar dust is made of. So the first thing to know, and this is, you know, probably obvious at this point, but in case anyone's still wondering, um, interstellar dust is nothing like dust in your house. Um, dust in your house is really gross, like hair and skin cells and awful things. So interstellar dust is much better than dust in your house. Um, interstellar dust is actually much more like soot, as we're used to on Earth, um, or sand. So we think when we look out in space, we can judge that there are kind of two types of dust that are out there in space. One is made mostly of carbon, and it's very tiny particles, so tiny carbonaceous particles that we're used to on Earth are kind of like soot. Um, and then the other is made of silicate material, so that's a lot of silicon and oxygen and magnesium and some iron. And um, those types of materials we're used to are something like glass or sand or, or that kind of thing. So um, this is the main types of composition we think interstellar dust has. Um, there's another type, though, that I really like. This is probably my favorite kind of interstellar dust. Um, and that is something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So on Earth, we're used to these as a pollutant, actually. Um, they're very toxic. You don't want to breathe these things in. Um, and and they're molecules, like really big molecules, or maybe really small dust grains, depending on how you look at it, that are made of carbon in rings with hydrogens attached on the outside. Um, and actually, the way they were first identified in interstellar space was by this comparison between a spectrum. Uh, this is a part of the Orion Nebula in the infrared. Um, and they saw these funny bumps in it. And they compared it to a spectrum of auto exhaust um, in the infrared and saw the same two bumps. And those two bumps are from polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And I really like the title of their paper, Polycyclic Aromatic Hydrocarbons in the Unidentified Infrared Emission Bands, Auto Exhaust Along the Milky Way. <laughs> so actually, it's, you know, the auto exhaust particles tend to, I think, are actually smaller than the, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons we get in the interstellar medium for the most part. But um, anyway, this is an important type of dust that is also out there. So. Another key point is how much of it there is. And to answer that question, I think it's most useful to um, try to make an analogy. So if you were to take a big chunk of the interstellar medium and to compress it down so that it was the same density as the air we're currently breathing, so that's 19 orders of magnitude of compression, if you'll remember, from something like one particle per cubic centimeter to 10 to the 19. Um, but if you did that, it would be so dusty in this room that you would have a hard time seeing your hand at the end of your arm if you held it out in front of your face. So um, it's pretty dusty out there in the interstellar medium. We're real lucky, actually, that it's not that dusty in here. It wouldn't be very pleasant. So um, this, is a, uh, this tells us how much of it there is, at least in the Milky Way. Um, the other thing I want to explain um, to try to get across is how we know what size dust grains are. And this is really closely tied to that observation that these star clusters and the things that we see behind clouds of dust look redder in the visible part of the spectrum um, than they would otherwise. And so uh, it's useful to remember the last time you saw a really smoky day and looked at the sun on a really smoky day, and it looks redder than normal. So that is the exact same process happening. And the reddening of light actually tells us about the size of the grains. So let me explain that real quick. So um, let's go back to this reddening question. So 
for just a moment, um, I want to think about um, dust interacting with a wave of light and make an analogy with a boat on the ocean. So if you are a really gigantic boat and you are sitting in the ocean and some tiny waves come along, and those waves are either destroyed, they're absorbed into the boat, or they're reflected from the boat, they go through. They don't pass by, right? On the other hand, if you're a tiny boat on the ocean with gigantic waves, as those waves come by, they are undisturbed by the fact the boat is there. You just, it just passes straight by and doesn't care. So this is exactly the same thing that's happening with dust. So if the wavelength of light is big compared to the size of the dust grain, the light just goes straight by. It doesn't care that the dust grain is there. If the light is a short wavelength compared to the size of the dust grain, it is either blocked or it's reflected. It's absorbed or reflected by the grain. So the fact that when we look at something behind dust, it looks redder tells us that the size of the wavelengths of the visible light we're looking at um, is comparable to the size of these grains. So in that case, you'd see um, here's blue light. Most of that gets blocked. Red light, most of that gets through. So in the end, we basically know that somewhere between blue and red is some close to the approximate size of these grains. So here's a little demonstration of that. Um, this is a, a cloud called Barnard 68. It's a, a dense, dusty cloud in the Milky Way. And this is stepping through a bunch of different wavelengths of light. So this is uh, 440 nanometers, 0.44 microns. So that's visible light. And this is also visible light. This one's a bit too long for our eyes to see, but it's uh, you know, 900 nanometers. Then we've got um, 1.25 microns, 1.65. 2.16, and what you can see is that at this wavelength, this is kind of a bluish wavelength, um, the, the dust completely blocks the light from all the stars in the background. But as you step through, you can start to see through the cloud until when you get here, you wouldn't necessarily even know it's there. So this means that these wavelengths are long compared to the size of the grain, and these wavelengths are comparable or shorter than the size of the grain. So we're talking about something that's like tenths of microns. That's the size of dust grains. And putting these all together, you can actually um, make an optical image. And I don't know if you, hopefully you can see this. The stars that peek through look very red. Um, this, is the, this is the process of reddening. And it tells us that the dust grains are kind of comparable to a tenth of a micron size. So having gone through kind of the, the basics of uh, how much dust there is, what it's made of, how we know what sizes the grains are, why you should care, I want to tell you a bit about the research I do um, trying to understand nearby, near, or trying to understand dust in nearby galaxies. So my goal is to understand why galaxies have the kind of dust and the amount of dust that they do. Um, and to get started, this is um, the Andromeda Galaxy, which you probably haven't seen looking like this before. Um, but this is an infrared image made with the Herschel and Spitzer Space Observatories um, looking at the dust in Andromeda. And in the spots where it's kind of bluish, the dust is very hot. And in the spots where it's reddish, the dust is cooler. Um, so I try to understand uh, a bunch of different things about dust in nearby galaxies. So that includes where do most of the dust grains form? Um, also, how is the formation and destruction and, and the life cycle of dust different in different kinds of galaxies? And then how do the properties of dust that those galaxies have go on to alter you know, how galaxies form stars or how uh, a lot of the things that happen in a galaxy occur? So to get into this briefly, um, I want to talk about the life cycle of dust. And we've, um, there's a bunch of different ways that dust is formed or destroyed. And I just want to step through those because they're kind of cool and interesting. And um, they change depending on what sort of galaxy you're looking at. So um, to start with, dust can form in the atmospheres of old stars. So in order to form dust, what you need to have is a bunch of heavy elements. And by heavy, I mean everything heavier than like helium, essentially. <laughs> um, so carbon is fine. You need to have heavy elements, and you need to have a lot of them. And it needs to be pretty warm so that they can run into each other pretty frequently and occasionally you know, have a chemical reaction or stick together to form these you know, agglomerations of heavy elements that, and minerals that form, up, form this dust. 
So one place that you can make that happen is in the atmosphere of an old star. This star has just spent its lifetime um, fusing elements into heavier elements in its core. And over time, you know, it builds up quite a bit of carbon and oxygen and uh, nitrogen. And as the star ends its life and produces these big planetary nebulae or outflows from these stars, you enter the exact right time when you have enough uh, material around and it's warm enough that you can start to condense these dust grains. So this is a, a beautiful image from the Hubble Space Telescope showing a, a star, an old star, that is in the process of kind of losing its outer atmosphere as it uh, prepares to become a, a, uh, a remnant of a star, a white dwarf star. Um, and it loses its atmosphere in these beautiful winds. And deep in there um, is where you can start to form these dust grains. So it's a dense, warm, and rich and heavy elements. Here's another one. This is a pretty spectacular looking thing. This is called the red rectangle. Um, and this is a star that is very actively in the process of producing dust. So um, people can watch it vary and watch it produce um, all this, this, these um, dust grains in its atmosphere. So that's one of the key elements of the dust life cycle. It forms in old stars. Another one is that dust can form in supernovae. So um, the Actually, one of the perfect spots to find a huge amount of, of heavy element material is after a star um, has exploded, um, after you know, fusing various elements into heavier and heavier elements over the course of its life. A massive star, at some point, ends up with a core made out of iron, and you can no longer get any energy out of the fusion of iron. And so that core will actually eventually collapse, and you will have this then gigantic explosion um, once the outer layers of the star fall in and then bounce back. And this is a core collapse supernova. And in that situation, you have tons of heavy elements. At, initially, they're really, really hot. But then over time, they cool off. And so for you past this Goldilocks moment where it's dense and warm enough and rich enough in heavy elements to form a lot of dust. So here is a supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A. Maybe some of you have seen this. This is an x-ray image of the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And each of the different colors shown here actually um, traces where there is a certain element. Um, so I'm not 100% certain of all of these, but I believe green is stuff that's more iron rich. And the red is stuff that's more oxygen rich. And then the blue is something that's um, rich in like silicon. So you can see where all these heavy elements are. And actually, if you look at Cassiopeia A with infrared telescopes and make a spectrum of what it looks like, you find this whopping peak in the infrared part of the spectrum around 22 microns. And that is the signature of newly formed dust in this supernova remnant. So um, we have great evidence that dust is forming in this condition. Another place we have really nice evidence of this is um, supernova 1987A. So maybe some of you were around, uh, not many of you, but some of you were around in 1987 to, uh, to hear about this. In 1987, there was a supernova that happened in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a nearby galaxy to the Milky Way. Um, and so in, uh, after many years, this is an image with Hubble. You can see this little ring down here. That's the remnant of this supernova remnant. Or sorry, that's the, that is the supernova remnant. Um, and this spot was looked at with the Herschel Space Observatory. And it's pretty subtle, but you see there's this little blip right there. And that is supernova 1987A glowing in the light of the new dust that it has created. So this is very exciting. It actually made almost um, the mass of the sun worth of dust, which is a lot. Um, and in recent years, people have done even more detailed studies. And so now this reddish image you see in the back here is created with a telescope called the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which lets you detect this emission from dust. And you can see where the dust is. It's right in the center of this, the remnant of this supernova. So that's very exciting. This one's my very favorite supernova remnant. Um, this one has a very poetic name, 1 e 102 um, It's located in the small Magellanic Cloud, so it's the little brother of the large Magellanic Cloud. Um, and this supernova remnant um, has been observed with Spitzer, 
um, as part of my PhD thesis. <laughs> and we found that it made a bunch of dust, only a few thousandths of a solar mass worth of dust, so not nearly as much as, as uh, Supernova 1987A. But this is really exciting. So there is new dust forming in this supernova as well. So um, the big question, or so in addition to forming dust though, supernova um, also destroy it. So this is kind of annoying. Um, so supernova, after they happen, there's this phase they go through, this Goldilocks moment where they have all the heavy elements and it's warm and it's dense and they make a lot of dust. But the other thing they get is this blast wave that just goes out into the interstellar medium at very high speeds and it runs into all the gas and dust that's already out there in the interstellar medium. So unfortunately, it turns out that supernovae are able to destroy something like 10 times as much dust as they make. Um, so this is a, a supernova remnant, uh, the remnant of supernova 1006, which actually people, is recorded in uh, human history. So um, this is, you can see this sharp boundary up here. This is the shock wave that is going into the interstellar gas. And when it does that, it basically wipes out the dust that it comes across. So um, supernova, it turns out, in the Milky Way are a net sink of dust. They produce some, but they also destroy a lot. So um, we're back kind of square one on supernova. There's one last part of the um, life cycle of interstellar dust that's really interesting, and that's kind of the, I would say, the edge of what we understand about dust. And that is that people think some dust must also form just out in the interstellar medium itself. So that must happen when grain um, stuff coagulates onto the surface of other grains and has chemical reactions and builds up this other component of dust. Um, and this stuff is very mysterious, so we don't know very much about it. Trying to understand how this happens is a, a very important part of, trying, of doing research in interstellar dust. So I just want to say um, a couple more words about my favorite research subject on dust. And that is trying to understand what happens when you go to a galaxy that just doesn't have enough heavy elements to make as much dust as the Milky Way has. So some galaxies have just not has it had as many generations of stars to produce heavy elements. Um, so that's something actually like these two guys, we already talked about this, this is the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. They are the nearby neighbors of the Milky Way, and the small Magellanic Cloud in particular has about one-fifth the heavy element abundance of the Milky Way. So that means like if you were to um, you know, totaling up the amount of, of heavy elements relative to hydrogen, then you would have about a fifth you do in the Milky Way. So this is an image we made of the small Magellanic Cloud in the infrared um, with the Herschel Space Observatory. And you can see that it does have dust. It's really glowing brightly in the infrared. There's lots of dust emission there. Um, and we can use this to measure how much dust there is. And it turns out that it has about 10 times less dust per amount of gas than the Milky Way does. In addition, my very favorite kind of dust, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, this galaxy has even less of those relative to having even less dust than the Milky Way. So for whatever reason, galaxies like the small Magellanic Cloud are really bad at making this kind of dust. And part of the thing we're going to try to understand with the James Webb Space Telescope is why. So why is the dust, the small dust grains, why are they so different in this galaxy? So um, just to wrap up the uh, this part of this about what I've learned about interstellar dust so far, I want to show you um, one other thing. So this is uh, the spiral galaxy M101 in infrared from Spitzer over here. Uh, this is optical from Hubble, and this is x-rays. So basically, one of the things I've been working on doing is mapping the infrared emission from dust in a whole bunch of galaxies, many of them uh, you know, big spiral galaxies like this, this one here, M101 and trying to understand why the properties of dust vary within the galaxy. And to do that, um, we did this big survey with, with the Herschel Space Observatory um, that has the very poetic acronym of KINGFISH, Key Insights into Nearby Galaxies of Far Infrared Survey with Herschel. Astronomers are terrible at acronyms. Um, so I did not come up with that. <laughs> 
Um, but what we did is we mapped about 60 galaxies to try to understand what determines how much dust they have in each different region of the galaxy and its composition. So this was a great project, really fun, um, lots of interesting results. Um, but unfortunately, as of 2013, April 29th, 2013 actually, the Herschel Space Observatory was done with its lifetime. So it ran out of its coolant, and at that point it becomes impossible to use it to study dust because the telescope is actually warmer and produces more infrared light itself than the things you're trying to observe out there in space. So goodbye to Herschel. Uh, Herschel is on an Earth trailing orbit. It's, uh, it was in the, it's the, this position called L2, one of the Lagrange points. Um, and so it's actually drifting away from us, essentially, and will just continue to kind of drift away. Um, yeah, it's, it's not orbiting Earth. It's uh, pretty far away from Earth at this point. So Herschel, goodbye Herschel. Um, so what's next? Well, the future of studying dust is about to get very exciting. So we're gonna, the, in 2019, so April-ish 2019, hopefully, they will be launching the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so this is a six and a half meter mirror um, that's composed of a bunch of segments. Here's a person looking at it in the, in the lab for reference. And I have a, there's a little video, I don't think the sound is gonna play, but um, there's some subtitles. So this is, a, this video is gonna show you um, once they launch JWST, all the stuff that has to unfold. So this is really a, a, a very impressive piece of engineering. So to get this up into space with a six and a half meter mirror, they have to fold it up all in, in, into each other. It's also got this ginormous heat shield, bunch of layers of uh, reflective material that block the sunlight from heating up the telescope. Um, and this heat shield is actually the size of a tennis court. So it is all rolled up in, in packed into this thing. And once it gets up into space, all of this unfurls and uh, forms this heat shield, which is just now finishing up. And then we got some solar panels, we got some other stuff. And pretty soon in this video, the uh, telescope itself is gonna unfold. Here we go, that's the secondary mirror. And now we're unfolding all the segments. Done. So. This telescope um, is so sensitive, so it's, it's optimized for infrared wave, observing infrared wavelengths. It could detect the heat signature of a bumblebee at the distance of the moon. So the telescope is actually has such a big mirror and such high angular resolution that if you were 24 miles away holding up a penny, it could see the size scale of that penny. Um, so there's one other telescope I want to tell you about, and this one is already operational. So that is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So this is actually an array of something like 60 telescopes at 18,000 feet in the desert of Chile. Um, so earlier we talked about how infrared light doesn't really make it to the ground. If you go to the longest wavelengths of infrared light, which is considered millimeter wavelengths, um, those wavelengths do actually make it to the ground as long as you have pretty good weather and no, not very much water above you in the atmosphere, which is why they put it in a desert in Chile at 18,000 feet. So this operates at uh, wavelengths right around here, so the very long wavelength end of the infrared. And this telescope is amazing. It's super sensitive. I mean, there's 62 of them all combined together to um, make image, image the um, you know, infrared or millimeter emission from distant objects. And so this is actually, you know, this image looks maybe not super impressive, but this is extremely impressive. So these red dots in the middle of these images right here are galaxies, you know, in the sort of less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And these are images made with ALMA of the emission from dust in those galaxies, you know, hundreds of millions to a billion years after the Big Bang. This is really early on in the history of the universe. We're at like 14 billion years now. So this was very early galaxies forming dust. The other thing ALMA has done that is, I hope everyone has seen this image at some point, is it has made um, images of nearby planet forming systems. So this is really like mind blowing stuff here. This is another star in the Milky Way galaxy and this disk you see around it is all the material that can form into planets. 
And you see these gaps in the disk, um, different rings. So one explanation for this image is that in those gaps in the disk, the material has actually formed into a planet. So Alma is making us an image of another solar system in formation. So this is very exciting. So with that, I want to um, leave you with a few last ideas about interstellar dust. Hopefully you've um, decided that you think it's important and you're excited now for JWST and for ALMA and you understand a little bit about how we know what dust is like in space. So interstellar dust is, you know, uh, much, is not a very big component of our galaxy. Most of our galaxy is dark matter. Um, most of the rest of it is stars and, and a lot of it is gas, but then there's a tiny bit of it that's dust. And turns out that little bit that is dust is absolutely critical for how a galaxy works because it absorbs photons from stars and protects those little nurseries where new stars form from getting all heated up by, by this interstellar radiation. It also is the, the material, dust out there in interstellar space is the initial condition for forming planets and for giving us the material that you know, makes up humans and everything basically we see around us pretty much. So um, understanding dust is critical for understanding our origins. Um, it also, we can observe galaxies over the whole history of the universe through their dust emission using Herschel, I showed you, and, and Alma, looking at these galaxies at early, early times in the universe. And lastly, I'm sure you'll agree after this talk, it makes the prettiest pictures of space. So with that, I'm just going to leave you with um, one of my favorite quotes and happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much.